as we discussed earlier, we are going to uh, talk about uh, the, the relationship between um, evolution and atheism. And as you have mentioned before and in your other interviews, uh, you believe that there is uh, that from evolution does not follow that there is no God. We can start from here and then, uh, as we also discussed in our emails, uh, I hold the opposite view and we, ca we can discuss that. Okay. Uh, so why do you think that uh, from evolution we cannot conclude that there is no God? What was the word? What's the question? That, that there is no God? What's the question? Uh, why can't we conclude for, uh, from the theory of evolution, from the correctness of the theory of evolution, that there is no God? Okay, well, uh, of course, that's what we call a loaded question in English, because I don't accept that the theory of evolution implies that there is no God. I, I don't believe in God simply because I don't have faith. And I belong to the sort of Kierkegaardian side of theology in the sense that I think that if you believe in God, it has to be an act of faith rather than something you reason to. So uh, although I'm a professional philosopher, I've never been that that enthused by uh, by natural theology. In other words, you know, the hand is so beautifully made, it there must be a reason I call it God or this you know, so-called fine-tuning argument, which is very popular these days, that everything fits together so well that if it, you know, it has to be God. And that, as far as I'm concerned, not only does it not prove it, but I think the whole thing is misconceived. I'm, I'm with John Henry Newman, the English cardinal of the 19th century, started as an Anglican and converted to Catholicism. And he said, I believe in design because I believe in God. I do not believe in God because I believe in design. So let's put my own personal position there, is there. So at a certain level, reading the origin, for me anyhow, one level has little or no connection with the God question. Of course it does, but um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not a Christian because of the origin. I'm not, not a Christian because of the origin. Now let's go to the origin itself, because I think there's often a big misconception about the origin of species, and the new atheists today are very much at the uh, front of this, uh, particularly people like Jerry Cohn, who say the origin is the greatest scripture killer that's ever been written. I don't think the origin disproves the existence of God at all, and in fact, Neither did Darwin. Darwin in the origin, he expresses quite clearly a deistic view that it makes more sense for a God to have created through law than by miracle. So, and he kept that. Now, towards the end of his life, Darwin became an agnostic, but not because of the science. It was because of the theology. He couldn't accept that good people like his father and his brother, both of whom were non-believers, would go to hell because they were non-believers. And Darwin said, you know, if that's what religion tells you, I don't want anything to do with religion. So, I, I mean, I'm empathetic to Darwin about that. So uh, at one level, I want to say, I just don't think the origin of species uh, works quite that way. Now, at another level, obviously, the origin does mean that certain aspects of Christianity, and I suspect Judaism, and I suspect Islam too, uh, conflict with what the origin says. For instance, uh, the origin obviously implies that the earth is very old, older than 6,000 years. And obviously, although the origin doesn't talk much about humans, Darwin talks more about this in The Descent of Man of 1871. <clears throat> although the origin doesn't talk about much about humans, it makes very clear that there was no original Adam and Eve, that we now know that, you know, there, there was always about 10,000 humans, not a big number, not a big number, but there was always a, a, about 10,000 humans. And uh, 
even you know, there were 3,000 who left Africa. So you and I uh, are part of 3,000. But, you know, we're still not Adam and Eve. And of course, the other thing is, I mean, the story, certainly the, the Christian story, is that Adam and Eve were in Eden. They were created perfect. And then they sinned. They ate the apple and got kicked out. And we're tainted with the original sin. And of course, the Augustinian position is what they call a substitutionary atonement, namely that the only way that we can be saved is through God's sacrifice on the cross. I, I mean, I just don't think somebody who takes the origin can accept all of that. Now, some some think they can. They they want to argue that the Adam and Eve is more symbolic or something like that. I, yeah, personally, I just don't think that works. So I'm not sure that you can be an Augustinian Christian, although not everybody is an Augustinian Christian. I mean, for instance, uh, an older tradition uh, known as incarnational theology, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, which is certainly the position of the Eastern Orthodox and quite a few, well, certainly some Protestants. I, I was raised as a Quaker and they would certainly believe this. They think that the death on the cross was not you know, had nothing to do with God, you know, saving us that way. It was more an example of unconditional love that we should emulate. And so I, I feel, I mean, you know, were I a Christian, I would be perfectly comfortable with that, perf perfectly comfortable with that. And so I wouldn't be, I mean, for me, the idea that there's an original Adam and Eve and that sort of thing really isn't that relevant? I mean, if I were a Christian, I would say, obviously, I believe in God as a creator. I believe in God as a good God who cares about us, whether he only cares about us or, you know, the Bible is a bit ambiguous about this. To what extent does God care about other animals? But uh, certainly, I don't think God's indifferent to other animals, but certainly God cares about us. He, he, we were created through a natural uh, form of evolution. That's just fine. That's just fine. In fact, the fact that we discover this is using our God-given reason. So I don't look upon it as anti-Christian to, to look at these things. I certainly don't look upon it as anti-Christian if it leads you away from childhood beliefs uh, to things which aren't as easy. Well, I don't look upon that as anti-Christian either. I mean, I think that's the whole point of using your God-given powers of reason. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, that it, that's not. Now, having said that, I do think this, that if you're still inclined to natural theology, which I'm not, but a lot of people are, the Catholics, for instance, uh, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Anglicans, Episcopalians, others like that, I do think the origin does do something there. I think Richard Dawkins was right. It doesn't necessarily make God wrong, but it makes him more unnecessary. I mean, if you, before the origin, saw the hand, how did the hand come about? The only way you can explain the hand is through a designer that, you know, it was designed. Or the eye. The eye is like a telescope. I mean, this is Archdeacon Paley's argument. The eye is like a telescope. Telescopes have telescope makers. Therefore, the eye must have an eye maker, the great optician in the sky. So, uh, I, I, you know, until Darwin, I mean, even David Hume admitted that. Now, after Darwin, that doesn't work. Now, as I say, for me, or the form of Christianity I would have were I a Christian, for me, that would be absolutely no problem whatsoever. I just simply say, and it's similarly about problems of evil and that sort of thing. I, you know, I don't think you can really solve the problem of evil. I mean, how do you explain all those Jews dying, you know? Or, you know, I, I, what is it? The, the Armenians deny this, but the killing of all those Christians in what is in the second decade of the 20th century. Uh, I mean, I just don't see how you could explain this. But of course, if, if you believe it on faith, you just simply say, well, I don't know everything. St. Paul said, now I see through a glass darkly. And that would be my position that I, there's an answer. It, it's not one that I have, but I have faith in God and I leave it at that. What I do think the origin does, though, 
is at some level it does if you're into natural theology it does make god seem a lot more distant in other words god is no longer you know the loving parent in quite that way and thomas hardy the a great English novelist and poet, I think, wrote a poem uh, in the early 1860s after he'd read The Origin. And he said, the trouble with The Origin or with evolution is not that it disproves God. I'll take these off for a moment. It's not that it disproves God, but that it, it makes God kind of indifferent. That God doesn't care about us. That, let's say, Mohammed or Mohammed Mo, that... You know, to, tomorrow you win, let's say you win the Nobel Prize for being the most intelligent young uh, Muslim of your generation or something like that. Tomorrow you discover you've got incurable cancer, which means you're going to have a year of absolute agony and then die. OK. What Hardy says is God doesn't care either way. God God, you know, it, 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 that's not what God doesn't worry about that. God, you know, something good goes for you. God, God doesn't care. Something bad goes. So God doesn't care. And of course, the difficult one is when something good happens to you to say, oh, well, I got these wonderful things. Thank you, God. And God says, you got what? Oh, nothing to do with me. And I think, I mean, God could be creator, but God is not necessarily as, as it were, the Christian God of love, of kindness, that elevates humans to a, an important position. So I do think that it can, it can have a, an influence at that sort of level. But as I say, I think that, that Christianity has got ways to deal with this. And I think what is interesting is that this Kierke Kierkegaard was writing before The Origin of Species was published. Kierkegaard was writing earlier in the 19th century when people had come up with a lot of arguments problematic for God, like the problem of evil. And I don't know whether you know the phrase higher criticism, but higher criticism is where particularly the German scholars, particularly at the beginning of the 19th century, looked at the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, not as a sacred book but more as ancient writings and said, let's, we, if we read, let's say, uh, something, you know, uh, the, the Aeneid or, or something by Homer, we read something about Homer. We don't just believe in the gods because Homer says so. What we do is we say, now, what, why was Homer saying this? Does this, you know, what period was he saying it? Is it consistent? Was it written just, is the style such that it was written all by one person? Is it such that two people wrote it at very different times with very different perspectives? And all of these sorts of things. That, that's what, and what these people did is they turned to the Bible and they said, okay, supposedly the first what, five books, the Pentarch, Pentarch, were written by Moses. Well, let's look at them and let's ask ourselves, does it make sense to say that one person, one man wrote all of these books? Now, the answer starts to come through. No. First of all, there's very different styles in the books. Secondly, often the styles come right in the, in the particular book. So you don't even think it's the book itself is written by one person. Third, you get all sorts of contradictions or things that don't fit in. All of it. Now, the, the, the higher criticism didn't want to say that it was worthless. They weren't saying that. I think a lot of them were actually believers. But they said, what we've got to do is look at the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, but the New Testament too. Less as something handed down by God as it were, like this, and more human, developed by human, human stories, fables, all of these sorts of things. In other words, if you're going to look, you shouldn't be looking at the Bible for the literal truth. 
You should not be looking at the Bible for exact information on when the earth was was uh, created. You should not be looking at the Bible for geology. Ah, there was the Noah's flood everywhere. So now let's go to go to America and start digging for evidence of Noah's flood. And higher criticism said, no, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And I think increasingly, a number of people, and obviously Kierkegaard is representative, started to say, then it's pretty clear that evidence, what we've got, is n- not going to prove the existence of God like we thought it would. That the Genesis is not a literal account of what happened. Doesn't mean to say that Genesis has no value. That's not the point. What it's saying is you can't regard Genesis as a work of science, which, you know, it's not it's not Moses's diary, as it were. And so. What what somebody like Kierkegaard said was, then I think we should pull back from that whole approach to God of trying to prove him through reason and those sorts of things. What we need to do is make this leap of faith. But of course, what Kierkegaard also said was, unless you make, it wasn't just Kierkegaard saying, oh, well, we must make the leap of faith because there's nothing better and we're stuck with doing this. What Kierkegaard said is making the leap of faith means making a commitment to God. In some, and the commitment, if God has already guaranteed it, then believing in it is, you know, it's not that important. I mean, if, for instance, I, I know that you're a perfect person, then believing you're a perfect person, you know, it's fine, but it doesn't give me any credit. But let's suppose, Mo, that you got into trouble. Let's suppose you, you were into trouble for something and you call me in, and I, I meet you in the, in the prison or whatever it is. And you say, oh, Michael, Michael, I really didn't take off my pants and show all the girls in the class. I'm not a sexual opposer or something like this. And I say, I don't know what happened, Mo, but I know you're a good person. I know. Now, if you did, I don't know that you did it, but if you did it, then I'm sure there was a reason, like somebody put something in your coffee and made you crazy or something like this. In other words, what I'm sure is I'm absolutely convinced I know you and I'm convinced that you're a good person. As far as I'm concerned, whatever the evidence is, my mind won't change on that one. And I think that's what Kierkegaard's saying about the God thing. And obviously, at some level, my commitment to you in the face of the evidence as opposed to my commitment to you when everything's easy, has more, what should we say, value. Because what I'm saying is, you know, I'm not saying, Mo, you're a wonderful guy. I know all about these. I really like you. God, that's fine. Mo, why wouldn't I? But what I'm saying is, Mo, things look very bad for you. I don't know what happened. But I do know, essentially, essentially, you're a good decent, caring human being. And that is my absolute belief. Now, I think most of us, so certainly I would want to say, at some level, that has more, I don't know, existential value. Being prepared to make that kind of commitment. That it, I'd say, yeah, it's not a question of evidence, Mo. It's just that I know you. I know you. And I know that you're a decent human being. So even if you did these things, I know there has to be some reason. Maybe you are, we all make mistakes. Maybe that was what was going on. Maybe you, maybe they put you up to it and it was a silly bet and you're a bit insecure. So you felt you had to take the bet. You look back on it and say, oh, what a fool I was. Yeah, we all make silly mistakes. But I still say, Mo, yeah, but I know we're all human. But I know deep down you are a worthwhile human being. And that's my commitment. 
And so I think this is what Kierkegaard wants to say about the God thing, that it's not second rate, anything but second rate. In fact, it isn't authentic unless at some level you've had to make what he calls that leap of faith. So basically, that would be my position. And as far as I'm concerned, then, all of these arguments about whether or not origin disproves God or whether fine-tuning now proves, proves God, I want to say, uh, yeah, they're irrelevant. And all, at the same time, all this business about, well, if you don't believe literally in Adam and Eve, you I want to say, no, it's never been the tradition of Christianity that you have to read things literally. St. Augustine, 400 AD, said the ancient Jews were not civilized people, literate people, like we Romans. They didn't know how to read and write and that sort of thing. And so if God had told them the truth in scientific terms, they wouldn't have known what God was talking about. So God had to talk to them in, in metaphors. You know, the rainbow is an arc in the sky or something like that. I mean, if God had explained to the ancient Jews all about, you know, the, the laws of light and how refraction and reflection causes it, they wouldn't have known what the hell he was talking about. So St. Augustine says, but it doesn't mean to say the Bible isn't true. Yes, of course the Bible's true. And Genesis is tremendously important. Genesis tells us that God is creator, that he created us, that we have a special place in his heart. And obviously, God expects us to do things. We sin, we fall off. But God, you know, that doesn't mean to say we can do these things. It means we've got to keep trying. So, yeah, Genesis gives us a huge amount of information. I mean, you take Noah's flood. Noah's flood occurs because people are doing bad things. And so God says, wipe them out, wipe them all out, except for Noah. And so Noah gets through. And what happens at the end? Well, it's the bit that usually your teachers don't tell you about. After they get down, Noah gets absolutely blinding drunk, stark naked, and his kid comes in and laughs at him. In other words, we're just as sinful after the flood as we were before. In other words, simplistic solutions just don't work. I think Noah's flood is a story of Noah is a deeply insightful story with great truths. It's just not a story about geology you know, or, or shipbuilding. It, you know, it's, it's, it's a parable. It's a, you know, it, it tells you a lot, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't tell you about the best way to build a ship. But of course, a lot of Americans think it does. And in fact, they've even created the ark at that creationist museum just south of Cincinnati. I, I've been to the museum. The, the ark wasn't built at that point, so I've not seen the ark. But uh, certainly, but I, you know, I would say if I were a Christian, I would say none of this is relevant. None of this is relevant. I mean, the, 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 all this literalism is 19th century when people, you know, wanted some sort of guide. The Bible suddenly cheap printing meant that everybody could get the Bible. And so you've got a guide. What, how should I run my family? You know, little Mo's been bad again. What should I do? Spare the rod and spoil the child. Whack his bottom. You know? Okay. Well, little Mo, you know, goes away crying and your wife says, oh, I don't think you... And you say, it wasn't a question of what I thought. The Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. End of argument. You know? And of course, so they, they use this in the night, but I don't think it's, it's certainly not traditional Christianity. And uh, so, as I say, my own personal feeling is that um, the, con the relationship between evolution, and particularly with the, the origin of species and religion, is a lot more complex than people think. I mean, <clears throat> as I say, obviously it's going to be easier to believe in evolution if, you, if you're a deist. In other words, if you believe that God doesn't interfere through miracles. God got it all going and then set back. If you're a theist, believing in miracles and Jesus and that sort of thing, well, what are you going to do about miracles? You're going to say either I interpret 
them in terms of laws, I don't think, you know, physical miracles occurred. I mean, for instance, the first miracle in the New Testament is the marriage at Cana, where Jesus goes to a, a wedding festival and they run out of wine and the, the host is upset. And Jesus says, fill up these pitchers with water, hocus pocus, and it's really good wine. Now, do you think an actual miracle occurred? Or do you think that Jesus made the host feel so uncomfortable that he went back into his cellar and got the good wine out that he'd been keeping all along? You know, I think a lot of us would say that, that feeding the 5,000. Well, first of all, is it 4,000 or 5,000? But feeding the 5,000, did Jesus actually make all those, those loaves of bread suddenly you know, become many, many loaves? Or was it the case that Jesus' love meant that people who got food turned to people who hadn't got food and said, please share mine. You know, in many respects, certainly I think a lot of Christians, certainly me, would want to say it's a much bigger miracle if Jesus, as it were, persuaded the people who got stuff who weren't going to share it, who suddenly said, of course I'm going to share it. Please, please feel free to, to share my meal with me much bigger miracle. Even, even the resurrection. Did Jesus actually rise from being a smelly body on the set Sunday morning? Or was it suddenly that the disciples, feeling so unhappy, so neglected, suddenly said, it's okay. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I feel fine. Even if somebody said, oh, yes, but it's just mass, mass psychology. I don't think, well, of course it is. But it doesn't mean to say it's not meaningful. So I've got a feeling that I think modern, more sophisticated theology can deal a lot better with the, with the whole question of science and religion than a lot of people think. And the interesting thing is, oh, and I'll shut up now. You can ask me some questions. I think the interesting thing is what you find is the critics come from both ends of the spectrum. And they both make the same mistake. The creationists, the, the, the biblical creationists like Dwayne Gish and uh, Henry Morris, think that unless you can show science and the Bible actually coincide, then there's something wrong with the science. Unless your science can actually show that there was a flood, let's say 5,000 years ago, which went all across the world, you know, which covered Tallahassee, then you've got problems. But I would say the interesting thing is that's exactly the position of Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins says, oh, we've got a clash between science and religion. And unless religion is prepared to give this up, then, you know, you've got, something's gone wrong. So they both think that, as it were, it's literal Bible versus, um, what should we say, a literal reading of the origin of species. Whereas I think more sophisticated thinkers, and particularly more sophisticated Christians, want to say, you know, that's not where the battle lies. This is all idiosyncratic, historical. There's, theology has moved way beyond this. And of course, the other thing is, I think a lot of scientists would more and more say, well, we don't think that science is going to be able to give answers to everything. That there's surely going to be some questions that science, you know, just can't answer. Why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, yeah, you can take it back from the Big Bang, but yes, but why is there anything at all anyway? Now, science says, I don't know, that's, that's not a question I ask. That's, just not, that's just not a question for science. And so what I'd be inclined to say, it, it, I mean, I, personally, I think there are other things like, you know, what is the mind? I mean, you can do an awful lot on, you know, pinning down where parts of thought come from in the brain. But why molecules should think? I'm not sure. I mean, Leibniz says science can't answer that. I'm inclined to agree with him. So there you go.
All right, now you have to. Yeah. St- okay, you have to stop listening and start thinking now. <laughs> no, I have taken some notes, so I have the record of my thinking here. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the answer that Kierkegaard gives, and that isn't the kind of faith that Kierkegaard defines dangerous or somehow not useful or can be used for everything. We can believe in everything if we have faith. We can well, believe you in can, the God. Of course, and that, of course, is the problem, isn't it? And I mean, that's what worries somebody like me, is I, let's say, you're, I'm a sincere Christian and you're a sincere Muslim. Yeah. And we have two different views. Mm-hmm. I believe that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Son of God, all important. You, as a Muslim, say, yes, Jesus was very important. He was a prophet, but he wasn't God. He wasn't even the best, the most important prophet. Muhammad was the most important, but Muhammad was not God. Muhammad was a man that God spoke to, a very important man, very important. But Muhammad was still not God. And to say Muhammad is God is heresy. So, yeah, this is the problem you have. People of different faiths, uh, you know, find different things. And so I think that this is certainly one of the reasons why I'm not sitting around waiting for faith. Of course, one way you get around this is to say, well, it's not so much that one is right and the other is wrong, but somehow we're all getting incomplete grasps of the elephant. Nobody sees the whole elephant. But we see different parts. Now, I don't know whether this works, but I think that would be the the kind of way to kind of go. I mean, if I were into faith, I'm not, I mean, I would say, look, I'm an Englishman. You know, I've been going to church. I feel comfortable with the the hymns, with the sermons, the patterns. So I'm going to go on doing this. This This is my culture. I like it. I find that this helps me to, you know, to do things. Uh, I mix with people I like and approve of in all of these things. But I could well imagine somebody saying, yes, but when it comes to faith, yes, I'm sure that God exists and that God is love. But what exactly that means, I really don't know. So you say to me, well, what about a Buddhist who doesn't believe in a creator God? And I say, well, what about a Buddhist? I mean, they certainly aren't just atheists like Richard Dawkins. I mean, surely the Dalai Lama is a very spiritual man. The Dalai Lama recognizes that there's something there over and beyond us, which at some level gives meaning. Now, is it not possible that what we're getting then is both of us, if you want to ask literally, probably both of us completely wrong. But it doesn't mean to say that what we've got is worthless. It means that we've got different perspectives. And of course, we're bound to have because we're humans and we have different cultures and that sort of thing. So, yes, that's the whole point, that you expect this to happen. And so that would be the kind of way I would kind of go. As I say, I'm not a Christian. I don't have faith. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's perfectly legitimate for somebody like me to say, well, yes, I see what you're saying, but surely there has to be some common ground. The Christian says there is a God. The Buddhist says there is no. I mean, Buddhists believe in gods. They just don't believe in a creator God. The Buddhist says there's no creator God. Is it, is it really possible that we've got two positions coming together on the same thing? Or is it not the case? that we've got one position and another one going like this. I don't know. I mean, as I say, as a non-believer. But the point is, you see, Mo, I don't spend my time trying to prove that God doesn't exist. You know, since I put it on faith, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have faith. So there we go. I'm not going to spend my time. I don't spend my time. You know, I think arguments about the problem of evil, I mean, of course, I dealt with them. I mean, I've been a philosophy teacher for over 50 years. 
So I talked about them nonstop. Of course I have. That's my job. And it's important. I mean, it's an important part of culture, even to know if you don't believe it, to know what it is that you don't believe. What is it that you're rejecting? You see, this is one of the problems, I think, with teaching uh, religion, certainly in the West, I suspect in your, your country too. I think it would, I don't want to convert all my students to become Muslims, but I think it would be hugely valuable for every one of them to have a good, what should we say, comparative religion class when they're 17 or 18, where the teacher was able to say, okay, let's look at the main religions that we've got, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hindu, um, what should we say, uh, what are we, uh, Islam, uh, maybe one of the Confucian, I don't know, Zoroastrian, you know, depending on how much time you've got. I think it would be hugely useful for students to hear, okay, Jews and Christians and Muslims all claim to worship the same God and all claim at least to have share some part of the Old Testament or whatever it is in common. But what does that mean? Now, I think it would be very useful, for instance, to hear, do the, do the Jews, for instance, read the story of Genesis in the way that Christians do? Well, obviously, at one level, they can't because they don't believe it in Jesus Christ as the Redeemer. And so the whole Augustinian story about original sin, as far as a Jew is concerned, is, you know, it, 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 it doesn't work. And I, I, I'm assuming exactly the same for, for somebody, somebody in Islam. I mean, because you don't believe that Jesus is going to come and save you. You know, it, it's not very good to have the problem in the first place. So I could see, but I could see a huge value in doing some comparative religions like that. But the way I'd be doing this is not therefore either to make Christianity look better or to make, you know, to steer everybody away from Christianity and make them all Muslims. I, it, it's, I'm a teacher. I think that the more you know, the better you are able to make these informed decisions yourself. So I have no regrets about having taught the argument from design and that sort of thing. In fact, because I've taught it, I know what it is. And now I'm able to say, I think with some confidence, no, it's not for me. It's just not for me. If I didn't know about it, then how could I reject it? How could I say, no, that's, that's I mean, I don't know if, the, if I don't know what the position is, I can't reject it. So I've got no objections, anything but, to doing these things. So I'm all in favor of a lot more comparative teaching than we get. I think that would be incredibly useful. Uh, and you know, that's one of the good things about university. Our, our you know, religion department does put on courses about in comparative religion. And I think that's absolutely valuable as anything. So I've certainly got no objection to anything but. But as I say, I don't look, it would not for me be something which is proselytizing or something like that. And, you know, obviously most Christians don't agree with me. But I think you'd find that there's a lot of sophisticated Christians, particularly Protestants, who, would, who find the kind of position that, you know, I'm working with, you know, they'd say, yes, you know, we don't agree with everything you're saying. But yes, we too have been influenced by Kierkegaard or by Karl Barth in the 20th century, these sorts of things. And we too would say, yes, it's faith that counts in, in the end at some sort of level. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, I also, and do you hear me? Because, ah, uh, yeah. What? Um, uh, yeah, uh, for a moment there was some technical error. My Skype uh, showed that my microphone is mute, but it wasn't. Okay. But it was solved. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So uh, I also would not spend my time proving that there is no God, that everyone should uh, become an atheist. But I think that is an important thing to do. And, uh, and I 
don't I wouldn't have had any problem with faith if someone would go to church every Sunday. Mm. I have the problem with the implications that it can have. You go to the well, uh, to church every sun Sunday, and then you suddenly decide that abortion is murder because the priest says so. Well, or one of the heretics. things is, yeah, one of the things I would want to say is I would draw a distinction between one's religious beliefs and belonging to a church or organized religion. And I'll be honest, I don't much care for organized religion. If I were a Christian, I'm not saying I would never mix with Christians or never go to church or anything. It would depend very much. I mean, suppose I was married to somebody who was an Episcopalian who liked to go to church on Sundays, who would, wanted our children to be raised that way. I'm not sure I'd go every Sunday, but I would have no objection to doing that. But, but what worries me is so often Christians get, well, um, let's talk about Christians. So often I feel Christians you know, they think they're better than the rest of us. And they're not really, and it, often it leads to bad things. I mean, look at the Catholic Church. I mean, I mean, there they are, they lay down the law, and yet we know what the priests have been doing to small children. It's horrible. And why are they doing this? Not because the priests are innately evil. It's because they're told not to have sex, and they agree when they're 18 not to have sex. And then, how old are you, Mo? How old are uh, you? I'm 30. Okay. Suppose, uh, here you are, Mo. Suddenly, no more sex. No more sex, Mo. No more sex, ever. Well, you know, I don't know that you'd think that well for the next few weeks. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's nothing personal. I mean, you know, it, there's nothing wrong. I mean... There's nothing wrong with having sexual desires. I mean, but to, that, in fact, is the ridiculous thing. But if somebody said to you, Mo, you're dedicated to Jesus, you are never, ever, ever to have sexual intercourse in your life. It ain't going to work. I mean, maybe it would work with you. Wouldn't work with me. I can tell you that right now, right now. So there's a case. It's like also the, the, the evangelicals and laying down the law on abortion or homosexual. I mean, I, I don't know where the Bible says you can't have abortion. I mean, don't necessarily approve of them. But, you know, the Catholics and Thomas Aquinas said openly that abortion is a bad thing. It's a sin. But, he, you know, he said that what the fetus isn't quickened in a female until, or what is it? I don't know, 40 days in the male, 80 days or something like that. So he said until that point, it's not a human. And so, again, it's not. So, I mean, I, this is what worries me, is my feeling. And look at the way the evangelicals have supported Donald, you know, President Trump. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard not to say that President Trump was an evil man, is an evil man, a disaster, a nasty, cruel human being, separating children, all of these sorts of things, not doing his job with respect to the virus. So, uh, I mean, America's got 4% of the world's population and 20% of the deaths. I mean, you know, that man has more blood on his hand. You know, he's getting up to Hitler style. I mean, it really is. So, as I say, uh, but the evangelicals support him. So, as I say, I personally am not that fond of organized religion. So, that would be my feeling. I mean, my personal feeling would be, you know, my faith is my faith. And I'll work with it from there. But don't forget, I'm in a funny position because I'm dealing with people all the time. And what am I doing for an hour this afternoon? Basically, I'm doing the equivalent of going to church because that's, you know, no, seriously, that's the sort of thing I do. I, I think about science and religion. I talk to people like you about these sorts of things. So it isn't that I don't, you know, I just close myself off from everybody and do it like that. It's just that, you know, I don't want to go to church. I, I, I don't want to have to, you know, you and I go in and start bowing down and, and prayers, you know, what is it, seven times a day or five times a week? Not interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the way that you became an atheist and also the way I became an atheist was not 
through evolution, was not uh, through scientific uh, thinking about scientific facts, but it was mostly due to thinking about the problem of evil. And I really haven't heard any reasonable answer, any logical answer from the religious people uh, on this issue, something that makes me think for a while. And I have also seen your debates with religious people. When you bring up the question of evil, they really do not have a very good answer. And their answers looks... Well, um... there, are, there are standard answers. Uh-huh. I mean, one of them is free will. That God gave us free will. This is a good thing. But it did mean that people were going to do evil things. Well, fr- frankly, I'm not sure that God giving Hitler free will was a very good idea. You know, frankly, if True. giving people free will means giving Hitler free will, uh, yeah, I just don't see it. I mean, why? Yeah, it, there's something wrong there. No, of course, if you're a Christian, you can put things in what they call the eschatological framework. You can say, yes, Anne Frank did die in Bergen-Belsen, and others have died, and they should not have died. They died, all those Jews. But of course, God, you know, this is, here on earth is a very short time, and God is going to make it all right in the end, or something like that. Well, yeah, okay, but I'm not sure that that's, I mean, again, I think that's faith. I mean, it's, I'm not sure you can prove that. And so, uh, no, I mean, the whole thing, though, is that religion is a complicated thing. But at the same time, I can understand why people are religious, because that's the trouble. There's a lot of questions science just doesn't answer. Important questions, like, why are we here? Why is there anything at all? And what's the point? Is there any point to it? Is life absurd or is there some point? You know, you're 30. Well, I'm 80. Believe it or not, Mo, the day will come when you're 80. And then, you know, it won't be long before, Mo, you're crossing the rainbow bridge or whatever it is you Muslims do, getting on the white horse and up like that. You know, well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But I, I think there's big questions about is what you're doing worth it? I mean, is, it, is there any point to what you're doing? Why are you not just spending all day and every day naked in bed with your girlfriend rather than talking to an old man like me with headphones on? You know, you want, now, what you're going to say is, well, because there's a time and place for everything and my life is made meaningful by exploring these questions and by trying to understand them. And, of course, also, I presume in your case, by saying, Yes, but not. But I want to share these with others. I'm making podcasts, not just for my own personal, you know, thing. That you know, when all everybody's out and the lights are down, then what shall I watch? Shall I watch pornography? You know, people having sex, or shall I watch Michael Roos? I mean, you know, it's not like that. I mean, what you're doing is some. And so, of course, at some level, you feel. Well, I feel too. I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't. You feel that what you're doing is makes your life meaningful. But this, the big question is, yeah, but a million years from now, a million years from now, and that's just like this in the history of the universe, just like this, a million years from now, is what we're doing this, you know, Monday afternoon, does it matter at all? Is, does it have any value whatsoever? Well, you and I, presumably, we like to think that maybe it does. So I'm not surprised that people say, well, I've got to try to make sense of it somehow. And also, again, I mean, the interesting thing about evil or pain is that when something happens, so often, far from people giving up on God, they turn to God. Let's say you've got a little child. Let's say you've got a little you know, little baby Mo, or, you know, three years old, a little girl Mo, and she's such a pretty little thing, and she's bright, and she's clever, and she loves you. You come home in the evening, and she's, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. 
you know? And then you say to your wife, she's looking awfully pale, isn't she? And your wife says, you know, I wondered about that. You say to her, well, maybe we should take her to the doctor. And the doctor goes, and that what the doctor says is, I think we should get some more tests, Ron. Well, you get more tests. And finally they come in and say, Mo, we're very sorry, but your little girl has got a really bad form of leukemia, blood cancer. We'll do what we can, but frankly, the odds aren't good. A year from now, your child has had so many tests, so much pain, and she dies. Now, the interesting thing is, I think, I'm not saying it would be you, how many people find God so helpful at a time like this that, you know, it's just been awful. But first of all, God has taken our child from us. Our child is in a happier place. But God also, he gave us the child for a while. But also God gave us that time of testing and showed us, showed me, showed I mean, often, you know, my wife and me, how much we love each other, how we depend on each other. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you grow apart. But that's what we do. And we tend to, the interesting thing is, yeah, some people say, God, I hate you. But so many people, the very opposite. They say, without God, I wouldn't have been able to go through this. So, as I say, I think it's all, it's all really quite complicated, though. And, <clears throat> But I, I think if it weren't for the case that at some level we're plonked here, condemned to freedom, we're, we're put here on earth, you know, I don't know why, but, the, you know, and we can, we can discover an awful lot of interesting things. Look at the way we're talking to each other across the distances and how people have discovered how to do this. So humans are very clever animals, but a lot of the ultimate questions... We just don't have any answers to. I mean, and as I say, then what do you do? I mean, do you do you say, I don't care, I'm not interested? Do you say, well, it means there must be a God who's going to explain these? Or are you like me and say, I don't know. I just don't know. Maybe there's no answers. Maybe, you know, it's hard to imagine, but maybe it just is. I don't. I mean, the Buddhists presumably at some level think that it just is that existence is at some level. Yeah, we can make progress ourselves and try to achieve nirvana and these sorts of things. But why the whole setup exists in the first place, there's no creator God, there's no reason for it. So that, you know, as I say, that's basically the position I've got. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I don't much care for evangelical Christians. But I don't much care for enthusiastic new atheists either. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I mean, maybe it's because I'm an Englishman, but I'm not that keen on enthusiasm. You know? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I'm not that keen on enthusiasm. Uh -huh. um, before getting to that, because I have a question regarding uh, new atheism, um, but um, what I want to ask about the probable answers to the question of evil. Uh, I mean, was there any kind of answer that gave you a moment of, gave you a pause that you had to think about that was clever? Because I don't think there has been an answer like no, that. No, you know, the funny thing is, Mo, I was brought up as a Quaker. I believed in God until I was 20, 21, 22. And then suddenly I realized I didn't. I didn't have you know, a, a spiritual experience or anything like that. I didn't see flashes of light. The devil didn't come to me. Just suddenly I realized I didn't believe in God. I thought then that by the time I'm 70, I'll probably believe in God again. Can't make a mistake. But the funny thing is, 70 went past and I felt no more inclination to believe in God than I did when I was 22. And I don't now. I mean, as I say, it's a mystery. I don't know. It's a mystery, but I, I, yeah, I, I'm inclined to think I came from dreamless sleep and I'm going to go back to dreamless sleep, but I have no answers to it. But I don't lie awake worrying at night about it. I mean, I think the most important thing you can do, 
as you're doing, is to try to have a meaningful life. And I look back at 80 and I say, you know, I didn't do everything I might have done, but I haven't done badly. I haven't done badly. And that makes that gives my life a meaning. And if that's it, well, you know, too bad. But, you know, for me, I've had meaning in my life. And that's what more can I hope for? Now, I, I have to go soon, Mo, because my wife is staying home because my wife wants to take the dogs out to walk. And one of them, I have to look after one of them while she's gone. So mm -hmm. any more quick questions? Um, no, I think we've covered everything. So All right, then. Okay. Thank you so much for your well, time. It's been great fun. And uh, tell your girlfriend that I hope next time it's she who's interviewing me, not her. <laughs> okay? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. Good luck after yourself. Bye-bye.